And I was like, oh, I'm going to build this. I got an order from a friend. I put it together. Turn it on. It blew up. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's not good. Um, so then I was like, okay, let me order some replacement parts. Put some replacement parts in. Turn it on. It blew up again. Um, third time, I finally got it fixed. I was three hundred dollars in the hole. I, I shipped the computer out, and the people who were funding me were like, "You lost too much money on this. We're done." Those were my parents. So, um, you know, what was the lesson? Well, make sure that uh, the people who are funding your business are funding it for the same reason that you know you, you're getting taken money. So I wanted to put the computer and start a business. My parents were tired of listening to me talk about it and just gave me some shut-up money. So, uh, you know, and then when, when it, they decided they gave me too much, it was, it was over. Um, the other thing was, you know, make sure you're doing everything to, the, to your highest standards. Right? So it doesn't matter whether it's school or whether it's homework or whether it's a business or whatever it is. Um, if it is a piece of work that if somebody gave it to you and you looked at it and said, this isn't good enough, then you probably shouldn't work at that level for yourself because you're just letting yourself down every day. And what I did in that case was I went to uh, uh, kind of there's a, a thing that would happen every few months at the fairgrounds where all these people would come in and sell computer parts. And I went there and I bought all these parts and the parts were bad. Why? Because there was no reputation, there was no level of quality there. And so I didn't. Um, I didn't perform to my own expected standards of quality. And so that was the key there. Don't, don't do that. Um, that. That came and went, and then I, I was in high school. Uh, I decided I really like, still like science, I still like engineering. I took a bunch of computer science classes, I learned to code, and... Where did you go to high school? Uh, Anglo High School. Oh. Anglo High School. Yeah, this is a... This is very small for me. We had 3,000 people. And so when you said the transition between classes, I was expecting like Grand Central Station level of transition. Mm -hmm. was none of that. Um, so we went there, and they had, they had really good science classes to some chemistry, computer science, and, and math, and all that. Um, and I did OK. You know, I'm not going to confessed to being the best student, but I did good enough. I mean, the, the difference between me and another student that may have had better grades was that I didn't care as much about the grades. I cared more about did I actually learn the material, not just for the test. Um, and that's critical. So you're in ninth grade. You have plenty of time to, to grow and learn. But if you go through your classes preparing just for the test, you're never going to, going to get anywhere um, once there's no more tests. Because it turns out that when you're 22 and you're out of college, or when you're 18 and you're out of high school and you go to work, there's no more tests. And so you can't just put everything to a number. Um, say, oh, I have to get it. No one cares. Um, so I went to NC State to do electrical engineering. Uh, I like computers. I try to code. I went to NC State. Um, graduated that in 2009, and along the way, I rediscovered what I liked about starting companies, and we um, tried to start a company out of my senior project, and that was we made a little microscope that was really cheap, and that microscope was for um, developing countries like Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, Kenya, Nairobi, all those areas, and then um, in India, Pakistan, and China, that they have uh, a lot of infectious diseases, infectious diseases like malaria and tuberculosis, and things that we don't really think about in the U.S. because they don't exist. You know, we, we eradicated malaria in the U.S. in the 50s, so none of us um, ever really had to deal with that. But it kills tens of millions of people every day in the rest of the world, and the big reason that it does that is because people don't know they have a disease. And the reason they don't know how they, how they did, why they have the disease is because they can't afford the instruments that um, allow them to find out that they have the disease. Um, and the instruments they have is the product. So they said, okay, that's a problem. Came up with this device to solve it. And we went over there uh, to try to sell it and everything. Um, 
we got the product. It, the company didn't ultimately work for a number of reasons. You know, the people I was working with, we all had different visions of what we wanted the thing to be, and we couldn't agree. So we went our separate ways. Um, it was also 2009, and I guess you guys were maybe 10 at the time, but um, so you may not have picked up on this, but the economy was pretty bad, and there was no money. So we needed about you know, $20 million dollars to pick this Nobody was going to give a 22-year-old $20 million to go and turn this into a company. Um, so that didn't work out. And after that, I went to grad school. I went to Duke, which was fortunately not unfortunately. Um, and uh, did my master's in biomedical engineering, which uh, was different than electrical engineering. And the reason I, I did something different was I said, well, I'm going to school, and it turns out that anything you can learn in school, you can learn on your own in a book, or in practice, or going online and just, just learning about it. Unless you don't know it exists, then how do you find out about it? So I said, well, what I want to do is something completely different than I've ever done before. And the most different from electrical engineering, I'm still in engineering, they come up with you know, biomedical engineering, they don't know anything about biology, and I really don't like it, but it has applications of engineering that are important and relevant and even though we kind of kind of cool. Um, so I went and did that. And at the same time, um, one of the people that was involved in my old company uh, called me and said, we want to start this new company, which is what I'm working on right now. It's actually maybe a mile down the road here. Um, and what it is is it's a way to tell if what you have is counterfeit or a genuine thing. So you've seen like counterfeit purses like Louis Vuitton bags or you're, you're in Chinatown or somewhere and you're like, oh, $5 for this purse and it's actually like a $1,000 purse and somebody's selling it for $5. There's no way that can be real. Um, well, it turns out that happens in uh, drugs like cholesterol drugs and cancer uh, drugs and uh, lifestyle drugs on a lot. And it's an industry that's growing so fast that it's growing at like 10 times the rate of the legitimate uh, drug manufacturers' businesses. And so we're like, well, there's two problems here. One, there's you know economic harm. But the bigger problem is it's killing people. So if you get the wrong drug and you're kind of on the edge of your life, you probably die. And it turned out there's about a million people, going back to the malaria and TB thing, there's a million people who they're unfortunate enough to get malaria or TB, and they're unfortunate enough to live in an area where there's not enough money to get access to the things to diagnose their TB or malaria. But somehow they actually get diagnosed, uh, and then after they get diagnosed, they're fortunate enough to actually have access to the drug, which is rare, and then after they get the drug, it turns out to be fake and they die. So they go through all this and they still die. And they say, okay, well, we need to come up with a way to solve that. And that's what we're working on uh, down the street. We've been doing that for about three years. Um, and let's see what else. The main thing I've learned over all this time is uh, generally I don't care for following instructions and um, following rules. Uh, but I, you know, and I, and I really like being creative. So when I worked in other jobs where I was an employee, I came in and they said, here's your list of things to do. And I said, okay, I'll do that list. And I was done usually quicker than um, most people were. Just because people who uh, don't care about their jobs and just don't work very hard. So I'm, like, well, I'm willing to work hard, and I don't really like checking things off the list. So I'm going to go do something where I don't have to do that. I can make my own set of uh, parameters under which we're running this business. And based on that is basically how I've done everything. How I approach school, how I approach work, how I approach starting companies, um, and showing up in places like this and, and telling you about not following rules and not telling your teachers that it's told you that. So um, I'm going to leave it at that.
I will <coughs> let you uh, ask me questions now. Please ask a lot of questions. If you want any more detail on anything that I said, or you want to explore further, we can do that. So whatever you want to ask about, whether it's companies or starting things or engineering or uh, school or uh, anything, what car you should buy in two years when you turn 16, that's fine too. Anything? Yeah. Apart from that, what's your name? Sean. Sean. And apart from that company you mentioned about number, do you have any other companies? Do I have other companies? Um, no. I mean, I, I do work with startups just kind of on a consulting basis, and I like I like you know hearing about things, but I don't have anything else. You, the the thing is that you kind of have to focus. And you make a commitment for about five years that you're going to put everything into this because the company doesn't have a support structure. It doesn't have you know, millions of dollars of revenue coming in like IBM does. Um, so if you're distracted, you don't your, your capability to execute and succeed is very limited. And if you don't put everything into it, then the the less you put in compounds compared to like a big company, because there's all these other people to pick up the slack. So in your company, we've got five people. We've got you know, three founders and two employees, and if any one of us doesn't show up to work, productivity decreases not by 20%, but more like 50%. So that's, that's pretty much all I do. Yes, uh, this, this, this microscope that you made. Yeah. Um, What's the name of your company? Because I I'm sorry? I heard about something. You heard about it? It was yeah. in the newspaper. Uh, it was called MedCount, um, the Microsoft company. And it's just a little black thing. We actually use it in the new company. But for the purpose. Um, you can't say always, but more likely, uh, because what you're doing in that job is you're making things that other people want to buy, that's your job, and if other people want to buy it, then, you know, there's revenue and there's a need for that, that role, um, whereas if you're in, a, like, you know, say you're an author, right? There's nothing wrong with being authors. You can make a lot of money being an author, like J.K. Rowling, make billions. But she's just one person, and you can write a book and put it out there, and and nobody likes it. Right? Um, usually, in an engineering job, somebody comes to you and says, "Hey, I really need this," and then you make it and you sell it back to that person. Uh, so just the economics of it work out a little better. It's a good feel. It's challenging. You, know, you, you really have to think, and, and uh, it's fun because you're solving problems all the time. Um, but it can be really rewarding and because of the effort that goes into it, and kind of the barrier to entry you have to have a degree. Um, well, you don't have to, but generally you have to have a degree if you're just getting a job. They pay you to match the amount of effort it took you to get into that position. Oh, I got another one. What's the graduating rate, like, as you said, for engineers? I don't know. But people who go into engineering, um, they do generally tend to graduate, I think. And if they don't graduate from engineering, if they don't usually drop out, they go to a different program. And they're also very successful in that other program. Because so if you go through two years of engineering school and then you say you want to actually do business, and you go into business, um, engineering is so, the, the bar for engineering is very high. And so when you go into business, you usually have a little bit of an easier time. Just because uh, business is a little more qualitative and engineering is very quantitative. So you can apply that kind of rigor and structure to what you did in engineering in business. 
and do really well. What was your most fun startup? Most fun was the MedCount, the microscope startup so far. Uh, we were like eight people about the same age, and we were in a room. The room was like from here to there, so very small. And you know, we had a little bit of set of things, we didn't have a lot of time, and so we just put all of ourselves into it. We just got along really well. And probably the most fun part was we made progress every day, so we got results. Um, and that's what made it fun. One last question. Can you explain a little bit about the technology and the engineering behind what you're doing now? Yeah, so what we do is, uh, so you, say you have a pill, like an aspirin. Um, what we do is we put little microscopic um, little particles in it and they, they go into the coating of the pill and they only light up when it, it gets hit by a certain light. So we put it under our instrument and it gets hit by a certain light and it looks like stars in the sky. But the stars in the sky are in certain patterns that are, we take a picture of it and we analyze the pattern and we tell you, you know, what is this drug, where did it come from, uh, is it real thing? Um, who like pays you to do this? Like, who are your clientele? Uh, so we started out. We were funded by investors to do this, so. and then the end end uh, customer for us is the pharmaceutical company. Oh, okay. Thank you. 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 So um, her name is Justine, and we actually work with her on some grants. And uh, what they do is they have little DNA markers, and they're more of a yes and no. Um, you know, it was this fracking fluid ended up in your water, or no, it didn't. Um, and effectively, they can be used similarly, but. <coughs> Um, the, the core differences are codes are more complex, our patterns are more complex, and so we can do a lot more stuff in much smaller batches. So we can go on every single pill that you'll ever eat, and each one can be identified to it. But we're actually working with them on some other projects. We just got mentioned in the New York Times. <coughs> Who did? Uh, she did? She did. Her oh. company. Uh, this week. Any questions about engineering? Mm -hmm. These bills, can you be like commissioned for a widespread, say, no, the, the federal vote uh, investigation? They like ask for you. Could you, I mean, are you at that level yet? Like, can you be commissioned? To do to perform like a widespread like, so on the counterfeit pills. Yeah. So what we have to do is we go on to the real ones when they get manufactured, and then we make sure that as they get distributed, the ones that are supposed to be real actually are. Real. And that's how that works. So if somebody comes to us and says we want to put this into our stuff, so then we say okay, we bust this one. When you were doing the electrical engineering, what kind of jobs did you, like what did you do? Uh, so I had, um, I had three or four different jobs when I was doing electrical engineering. I worked at IBM developing software and testing software. Um, and then I worked for a defense company up in Wake Forest. And what we did, it was kind of cool actually, we built uh, systems that could detect enemy things in the water. So if it was a submarine, we could detect if a torpedo was coming. If we were an aircraft carrier, we could see a periscope sticking out of the water. Um, if we saw a radar signature, we could say, that radar signature belongs to this country ship. Uh, just 
early detection kind of um, thing. And they're they're a fast growing company that, that hires a lot of people. So. Any other questions? We got five minutes, or we can break. Okay. Well, can you all say thank you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.